your love is not like ours. Our love judges by appearance, but yours looks deep in the heart. Our love coldly counts the cost, but yours is freely given. Our love cannot bear much pain, but yours is ready to suffer. Our love wants instant results, but yours keeps waiting and hoping. Holy God, in Christ we celebrate the warmth of your welcome, the strength of your goodness, and the folly of your faith in us. Glory to you. Amen. Let's rise and sing God's praise, a song that reminds us of the Christmas story and how much God loves us. Joy has dawned upon the world. How many of us know how to swim? Okay, that's not too bad. That's not too Swim. Do some hand actions as well. I remember learning to swim when I was at primary school, which was a long, long time ago. Um, but I did not take to swimming like a duck to water it would be fair to say. It was a, a frightening experience for me. I didn't really like being out of my depth. I didn't like being too far from the side so that I could quickly grab a hold because I continually felt like I was going to drown. We didn't have 
things like this when I was learning how to swim. Can anybody tell me what one of these is? Does anybody know? A noodle, that's right. It's a great thing that you kind of wrap around you um, and it helps to keep you above the water. Or you can get floating things and you can get armbands and you can get all sorts of wonderful contraptions nowadays that help you to learn how to swim. Because you can't learn to swim if your feet are continually touching the bottom. You can't learn to swim if you're, one of your hands is continually holding on to the side. There's a story told about a boy who was desperate to learn how to swim, but he was afraid that he might drown, and I can empathize completely with him. One day, this little boy got a new swimming instructor who knew exactly what the boy needed. He knew that the boy was afraid of drowning, so as the lessons began and the boy began trying to swim, this swimming instructor walked alongside him with his hand just underneath where the boy's belly was as a kind of safety net. The little boy knew that the instructor was there with his hand just underneath him to catch him if he was ever going to, to go under the water. He knew that he had nothing to fear because the instructor was right there beside him to keep him from drowning. Life can be a lot like learning to swim. It can be frightening. There are times when we face uncertain situations that we may be afraid that we are getting over our heads, out of our depth. And like the boy holding on to the side of the pool or me, afraid to go deeper than I could stand up in, we want to hold on to things of which we're sure. We want to remain safe where we know we can stand. But the Bible tells us that there's no reason for us to be afraid. Just as the swimming instructor's hand was there to keep the boy from drowning, the Bible tells us that God's made a promise that He will be there for us when we go through deep water. Listen to His promise at the beginning of Isaiah 43. But now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, He who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through rivers, they will not sweep over you. We're at the beginning of a new year. It's time for a fresh start. It's a time of new beginnings. It's exciting. But it can also be a little frightening. As we face new situations in the coming year, we need to let God's hand support us, just as the noodle supports those learning to swim because God is always there for us, and He won't let us down. But He goes on to say even more in Isaiah chapter 43, and I want to read that for us this morning. Isaiah 43, starting at verse 14 and reading on to verse 21. This is what the Lord says, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, for your sake I will send to Babylon and bring down as fugitives all the Babylonians in the ships in which they took pride. I am the Lord, the Holy One, Israel's Creator, your King. This is what the Lord says. He who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters, who drew out chariots and horses, the army and the reinforcements together. And there they lay, never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and
Because Isaiah was writing to people who were once again enslaved. They'd been taken out of the land that God had given them. They were exiles in a foreign country, Babylon. They were no longer able to do what they wanted to do because they were under the control of a foreign master, Emperor Nebuchadnezzar. The situation that they were living through had strong parallels with what their ancestors had experienced. They knew the stories off by heart of how God had rescued them from Egyptian slavery. They could recite the stories of how God led them safely into the promised land. The land that he had promised to give Abraham and his descendants many years before. They needed to be reminded of how God had saved his people in the past because they needed saving in the present. They needed to know that once again God could and would save them just as he had in days gone by. They needed to know that the years didn't matter because God had a long memory. Yet, as they remember the past, it brings them hope for their present situation. It's something that they can hold on to, something that they can gain comfort from, something that they know the truth and the value of. But then God tells them to do something good. To forget the past. There they were in exile. There they were longing to return to their homeland. There they were looking for God to rescue them. There they were remembering how God had acted for his people in Egypt. And this was because it was God who had brought up these memories for them. But he tells them to forget the past, to forget the former things, to not dwell on what has been. God goes and tells them to let go of the things that worked in the past. Why? It's quite simple. Because they and we are not God. There is a danger when we have everything figured out that we don't need faith. We know the questions, we know the answers. We're comfortable with what life brings us and we know exactly what to do because we've done it before. But that kind of attitude reduces our dependence on God and increases our faith in ourselves. And that's a dangerous way to live. It's not how God wants us to live. He dares us to believe in Him for new things. He challenges us continually to let go of the controls and trust Him in all things. Because He wants to stretch our vision. For the past almost three years now, since the very early days of the pandemic, I've been wondering how church life would change as a result of what the world and we were all going through. I've often wondered how we could best support one another in our faith journeys when life was so different. I wondered what the different things that we should be focusing on were. I wondered what we would be coming back to after all those months of not being able to meet together in this building on Sunday mornings for worship services. I wondered what shape church life should and could take. I guess the sad thing for me is that I still haven't stopped wondering that, though it's not always at the forefront of my mind as it was. And that's partly because, like many, I was desperate for things to return to the way they were. Until very recently, the deacons were meeting fortnightly online, and often 
within the discussions of the meeting, there were times when we were trying to work out what church could and should be like and how quickly we could or should go back to how things were. Video services were good, but not as good as being together in worship. Daily thoughts were helpful, but not as good as a proper sermon. We longed to be back in the building. Back to our old seat. We were desperate for the seats not to be so far apart, to remove masks so that we could sing unhindered. And slowly, we were gradually drifting back to pre-pandemic services and settling into the new norm which was as close to the old as we could, though not as close as many of us desired. There was that desire to go back to what we knew and were comfortable with. And then God broke in and started something new in our fellowship. Because this last year has seen some dramatic changes in CTBC, which none of us saw coming. And it's not us. It's all God. It's Him who's doing something new among us. Because just over a year ago, God brought four asylum seekers in our midst who sat in a row over there and joined us in worship. And life for us has never been the same since. But He didn't stop there because all last year, new people, from other parts of the world were appearing in the building. Not all have stayed, but many have. They come with their own stories, their own experiences, their own needs, but also their abilities, which they offer to church life. Almost half our congregation on a Sunday now consists of people who weren't originally from the UK. Many don't have English as their first language. We have numbers of young children that we haven't seen for years. We have people wanting to get involved in church life and there's a desire to reach the communities around us with the good news. God wants to do a new thing in us. And this new thing that has begun started with our willingness to take a step of faith. Back in autumn 2021, we planned a baptismal service. It was our response to a challenge from the Baptist Union of Scotland. But there was no one that we knew within the fellowship that was looking to be baptised. No one came forward in the weeks that we were highlighting it. But the very Sunday that it should have taken place, the first of our new friends arrived. And God started a new thing among us because we were willing to trust Him, to take a step of faith. But that new thing isn't finished. And it continues with us willing to take steps of faith. <clears throat> God is telling us that He wants to do a new thing in us right now, in this year ahead. We're all trying to figure out what that means for us, but the challenge for us is to make sure that we remember the past and forget the past. We need to remember the lessons that God has taught us in the past, but not rely on the methods that were used. It's been said by someone that the seven last words of the church are, we've never done it that way before. We learn things about God from the past. But we need to be careful not to enshrine the methods of the past. 
Unfortunately, we have a habit of enshrining the methods and forgetting the truths about God. Isaiah this morning is challenging us today to remember the lessons from the past, to hold on to them, but to forget the methods that we've used. We cannot expect or hope for things to return to exactly the way, the way they were before. We shouldn't expect to do things the way we did in years gone by. But we must remember that the God who led us to this place is the God who will lead us to the next place. He's the God who's walking along beside us with his hand underneath us, stopping us from drowning. He's the God that we can trust. He will show us the methods that we're to use now as we seek to be disciples of Jesus who disciple others. He's the God that we're to trust for our future and to know that he will do a new thing in us as he's already begun to do. Who knows what's around the corner for us as a Christian community in the city centre, seeking to make Jesus known. God knows. Amen. We're going to sing a couple of songs. The way God chooses to work in his world are always changing. But God is the same yesterday, today and forever. We'll sing a hymn that reminds us of God's timeless love for us. My song is not alone. After which we're going to sing a newer song, Oceans, which challenges us to continually trust God in the uncertainties of life. But stand if we're able and sing God's praise.
Let's take a moment now to pray for others. This is a responsive prayer and the words will be on the screen. There will be moments of silence throughout the prayer and at the end of those silences I will say, in the life of our world, if you can respond with the phrase, your kingdom come, O Lord, your will be done. And we'll close the prayer with the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. There won't be a version on the screen, but feel free to use whatever language or version you're most comfortable with. Let's pray. Gracious God, rejoicing in your blessings, trusting in your love and care for all, we bring you our prayers for this world. We pray for the world you created, for those who rebuild where things have been destroyed, for those who fight hunger, poverty, and disease, for those who have power to bring change for the better and to renew hope. In the life of our world, we pray for our country, for those in leadership who frame our laws and shape our common life, who keep the peace and administer justice, for those who teach and those who heal, and for all who serve the community. In the life of our world, your kingdom come, O Lord, your way done. We pray for people in need, for those whose life is a bitter struggle, those whose lives are clouded by death or loss, by pain or disability, by discouragement or fear, by shame or rejection. In the life of our world, we pray for those in the circle of friendship and love around us, children and parents, sisters and brothers, friends and neighbours, and for those especially in our thoughts today. In the life of our world, your kingdom come, O Lord, your will be done. <clears throat> we pray for the church in its stand with the poor, in its love for the outcast and the ashamed, in its service to the sick and the neglected, in its proclamation of the gospel, in its welcome of the stranger in this land and in this place. In the life of our world, your kingdom come, O Lord, and your will be done. <coughs> Eternal God, hear these our prayers, the spoken and the silent, through Jesus Christ our Lord, and help us to pray, as Jesus helped his disciples to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory for ever. Amen. 
as we draw our time together, let's rise and sing a hymn that reminds us of the 100% to build a trustworthiness of our God. Rock of ages, cleft for me. Let's close by sharing the grace with one another.